Hi, I'm Steve Goodman and on Practical 365 today, I want to talk to you about how you can build a lab server for Microsoft 365 for under $500. Now, the first question you might have on your mind is why? Why would I do this? I spent all this time moving to the cloud and Practical 365 is saying build servers. Well, no, if you've moved everything to Microsoft 365, if you've moved all your on-prem stuff, to the cloud, then you probably don't want to look back. It's only if you need to learn about more complex scenarios. So if you are working with lots of customers and you're helping them on this journey, moving to Microsoft 365, then you'll have seen a trend for moving from Office 365 E3 licenses to Microsoft 365 E3 and now to Microsoft 365 E5. I would say you know, at least 50% or more of the customers I work with are either looking towards or have bought Microsoft 365 E5 licenses. And new customers that haven't moved to the cloud yet, there's usually a good reason for this. There's complex environments on premises as well. So there are good reasons for doing this and it's not really you know mad. However, if you are thinking to yourself, no, this is not for me, then, then stop, don't worry about it. But there is a need, especially if you are running a hybrid environment, so AD on-prem, you're running a couple of exchange servers for mail relay, recipient management, to maintain some of those skills. The one thing that this Hafnium thing from a few months ago, and well, on the podcast uh, recently, we were talking about another set of security updates for exchange as well. You know, they're finding a lot of the stuff here. You've got to keep patching regularly. If you're not up to date on your exchange skills, then you probably need something that you can use to use to brush up on those skills and maintaining on-prem skills using a lab server is the perfect way because you don't really want to test in production if it is your mail relay uh, for your application servers and all that sort of critical stuff running your upgrades for the first time in gosh knows how long it's probably not such a great idea but there's more right this complex environment scenario so i'm coming across customers who have two sort of complex scenarios. One will be perhaps regulations that they have to deal with, and they might need to move from older legacy technologies. You know, if someone's still got something like Mimecast or Proofpoint, or they're running on premises stuff around that, or they're moving from file servers into OneDrive and SharePoint, they've got to reorganize the data, and you've got to set up the migration agents for the SharePoint migration manager and so on. You want to test that out, you want to examine what complex data structures look like, trying to build out what the target information architecture is, then these are good reasons to be able to test out a different environment. So, you know, your legacy exchange source environment, old sort of legacy Mimecasty proof point stuff. You want to move those to, to something like Microsoft Defender for Office 365. You want to see what that process is like. So you're going to need some environment that's going to have a representative before and after. And I'm also seeing lots of multi-forest environments as well. So companies who have a bit of a mess and there's a reason why they didn't decide to go to Microsoft 365 yet. And this is the, the chance. They bought the licenses and we've got a complex multi-forest scenario to deal with. And you want to be in practice with that. And the other scenario is the client aspect to it as well. So lots of device migrations, forest consolidations around at the moment. So you want to be able to do some of the work that goes with that. And this is where a lot of this is key, because if you're doing a migration uh, for AD, then you're probably going to do this as part of the Microsoft 365 migration, where you might be moving user accounts between forests to consolidate things together. But it might be the opportunity that you won't have for a long while yet to get rid of things like Config Manager or, or one of its competitors and move straight to Intune. Get rid of the old stuff. Move machines to Azure AD managed. Now, you might want to test out some of these scenarios, though, because perhaps if you've never tested uh, Azure AD joined Intune managed machines where they're connecting, perhaps using a VPN client with always on VPN or, or something else back to on-premises to access file shares using AD credentials, then you want some sort of test bed to see that in action and test it in different scenarios. If you're doing that for your organization, then perhaps you won't buy a lab server yourself to do this. But you might 
want to buy one if you are doing it for lots and lots of different customers. If this is your day job, doing it over and over again. The other thing is we want to learn about new stuff, all right? You know, you might be thinking, I've done Microsoft 365, what's next for me? There's so much to explore, as we've just said, but there's also stuff where you get a lot of overlap as you move. For example, that file server migration might involve some stuff going to SharePoint Online, some stuff going to OneDrive for Business, but other stuff going over to Azure Files. And if you want to do that, then you might want to be able to test those kind of hybrid scenarios where data is cached on premises. You might also, alongside your Microsoft 365 project, be working with technologies like Azure, and you might have long-term hybrid on-premises requirements as well. So whilst you could spin up a simple environment in Azure, on-premises is going to give you some of those capabilities where you can learn about Azure Arc and some of these more interesting up-and-coming technologies where you're not going to get the chance to, to build out and test these anywhere else. Now, the problem is, and I've, I've had this problem myself, how do you do this relatively cheaply and the cheapest way of doing this is to buy secondhand hardware so ebay is your answer to most of these so i had a couple of options so one was buying a mini pc to do this so i thought right i could buy a mini pc and with this mini pc I could keep it somewhere quiet out of the way and that'll be quite nice but when you look at these, they're really expensive. So you know, if we're talking pounds, £1,500, $2,000 for something with 64 gig of RAM and might have an i7 processor or i5 processor, but it's a laptop processor. It's not a massively brilliant workhorse. I mean, it's in one of these, the MTR behind me. It's good for that. But would I want to run my whole big complex lab environment on it? I don't know, I don't know. The other one was desktop workstation. And the great thing about a desktop workstation is you can build out stuff uh, and also use it for other things as well. So this is a desktop workstation here that I'm using to record on, uh, do all the videos on that, and I run virtual machines on it too. And that's what I was using until I thought, well, I can't put more than 64 gig of RAM in it. And again, you know, we're talking about the same sort of money, you know, $1,200, uh, but a desktop workstation does have some advantages because if we're using a desktop workstation, then one, well, we can put nice coloured fans inside it and make it look all nice and fancy. Uh, but we can also stick a fancy graphics card in it as well. And with a fancy graphics card, that does mean that you can do things like some of my other videos, like the NDI stuff, where we are going to rely on being able to offload some of that encoding to the GPU. So you can do some cooler things with it. But if you're trying to do stuff uh, where you want to build out a really big lab and you're also going to be using this to control the lab, then this is where you're going to get to a point where if you're using above 48 to sort of 50 something gig of RAM and you've got 64 gig of RAM maximum in one of these, these boxes, then you're going to come into some problems because the PC is just going to run very, very slowly and you've spent all that money and then you realize you're back to square one do i buy two pcs <laughs> and uh and is it a waste to have a really nice pc hidden away uh that i can't actually use for anything so the other option or the last option of these is secondhand servers and this is where the ebay angle comes in so what you can get off ebay uh is something like this so this is this is not on at the moment this is a video I recorded earlier just to show you what one looks like inside and there's a part of me uh, that when I look at that I think I remember buying servers like that um, 10 years ago and I never thought I'd be buying one to stick in my garage so granted uh, if you have been buying servers and you've thrown away better than that then I'm in the same boat as you you know I had servers like that um, and then I would place them with blades years ago. And the these are actually perfect for what we want. So if we have a look at eBay, as I said, that's the place to go and look for. You look at something like a Dell R710, 128 gigabyte RAM. They're so cheap now. You know, if you look down here, 128 gigabyte RAM, you can go higher, 256 gig, 192 gigabyte RAM, whatever you want next to nothing next to nothing at all you know you can buy some very cheap servers 
that are going to be great for running a complex lab. Because remember, you're not expecting this to run your organization. You're not going to have live users on this. You're just going to be building it out. And what you want is virtual machines that are up and running. And when they're up and running, you're going to be doing stuff on them. But apart from that, no one's going to be accessing mailboxes. Apart from when you t test data migration, then n not much else is going to happen. You just need the RAM there to support what you're going to be doing. So, for example, if I look in Hyper-V here, I've got the desktop, and that's got a few VMs on it. So a couple of VMs that I'm going to use for some local client stuff. But then on here, I can just keep on piling on stuff. So I can build out multiple clients. I can build out multiple active directories, multiple exchange environments, supporting servers in the environment as well. I can run Windows 11 on it if I want, even though it's an old server, they support TPM2. It's not going to work forever when it's GA, granted, uh, but I'm going to be able to run Windows Server 2019 and I'm going to be able to run whatever I like apart from that. Now, Hyper-V is one option. Uh, obviously, there's there's a Windows licensing issue here. So if you've got an MSDN license or you've got access to licensing for test and dev, then that is a, a great thing. If you are struggling in areas like that, then you can obviously use trial copies if you're going to be doing something more than once. Uh, and the other option is using ESXi. So for me, I am a VCP still, um, lapsed though. I think the last time was... 5.5 um, and yeah in, a, in an earlier life then I was setting these up for customers uh, installing them into hyper converged installations back probably what uh, eight years ago uh, would probably be the last time I was actively doing that but what we can do you know we can use I don't even have to touch this server mine is in the garage um, we can download the free version of ESXi it's a single server so it doesn't we don't need vSphere on it we don't need a lot of the functionality that we've got normally available to us but it's free um, it's a free license you can sign up um, on the VMware website and you can install it and it's not going to take up a lot of space on the box and it means that it's effectively going to be a workhorse so uh, I've got Hyper-V on it at the moment next thing I'm going to do I'm going to go to ESXi just to, to simplify this down because uh, really to sort of test this setup, I've done a, a full server installation. I'm either going to, you know, you're either going to use server core or you're going to use something like ESXi uh, and then run your Windows VMs on top of it. You know, that's the, that's the sensible option. And most of these servers, they come with iDRAC 6, which, as you can see, I have to use an old version of Java 4. It's, it's an old server, you know, uh, but I can do everything I need. You know, I can download the ISOs, drop it on there, and then I've, I've got my box ready to go. Now, the other nice thing, if you were using um, a Hyper-V box, is you can use deduplication. So if I drag over this window here, then uh, you'll see that I've got all these VMs, and these are all on this disk. Uh, so I've got a lot of I've got a lot of virtual machines in here taking up a lot of space. Um, so size 432 gig. I've got a one terabyte SSD. So that cost me on top of my uh, 300 pound. It cost me 100 pound. I bought a uh, 970 Evo Samsung one terabyte SSD. Something fast and reliable. Um, that's connected via uh, HBA mode rather than a RAID array. Uh, so it all works properly. Uh, and then I've switched on dedupe in Hyper-V, uh, sorry, in Windows Server. Now that has squashed all that down because remember, I'm running lots of Windows servers on here, mostly running the same versions. And I've got templates as well. That's using 93 gig of space. So I can keep on piling stuff on if I want to use the server this way. Or of course, you know, you can go You've not got those MSDN licenses, but you need to build out other stuff and you're going to use some trial licenses, uh, but you don't want the server that you're running it on to expire. Then this is where ESXi comes in, because although that's going to continue to con consume space, realistically, a terabyte of space is a decent amount of space to install uh, a whole bunch of virtual machines. And then you can buy some cheaper storage. I've got a two terabyte uh, SASA drive to, to move some of the unused virtual machines across when they're not being actively used. So some really cool stuff that we can do with this. Um, and for not a lot of money. I mean, that's that's 
That's really the kind of stuff that, even if we go back a couple of years, it would have cost a lot of money to, to build out. Uh, now, when we're thinking about this second-hand server scenario, the other thing that I was concerned about was the power usage. And the power usage isn't, for, for servers like that, to be fair, uh, as long as they're not full of enterprise disks, it's not high. So it's roughly the same as the desktop machine that I've got. Um, and, of course, you don't need to run it all the time either. Uh, the key to this is a 500-watt power supply, or 550-watt power supply. I think that R710 um, that you'll find on eBay, uh, similar machines like it, they're not going to consume all of that power, and you're not going to have it under load all of the time either. And because you're using a consumer-grade SSD plugged into it, because it is just for testing lab, you know, it's, it's not intended to be a workhorse, then it's not going to take up a lot of power. It's going to use you know less than 100 watts when it's on. Uh, and the noise, well, when you turn it on, it's absolutely epically noisy. It is just whoop. But if you've built servers before, then you will know that after about a minute, it all calms down. Uh, and it is uh, a mild hum. So for me, I put mine in the garage. Check out my Twitter. Um, I did put the, the long of how I drilled a hole through from under the stairs where all our internet comes in and all the, the, the structured cabling is uh, into the garage and then hooked it all up there because best thing is, you know, keep this stuff out of the way. You know, you don't you don't want to be sitting in your, your office at home of an evening with a big rack uh, by the side of you humming away, annoying everybody in the house. So keep it as far away as you can. Now, if you haven't got the ability to drill holes through your wall or don't want to, then you don't have to because these little things, well, you must have seen these before, right? Uh, power line networking. Remember, this is not going to be the server that is going to connect a gigabit connectivity to the outside world. Uh, you know, if you've got gig connectivity, great, but you, you're not going to have tons and tons of clients connected to it. And uh, although these, uh, th you know, this is a fairly standard TP-Link 1200 megabit uh, per second uh, plug-in uh, box, you'll get, i get about 150 to 200 meg. Um, and that's uh, a new build house. Uh, and I'd expect roughly you'll get about 70 to 100 meg, which is, which is fine. And a couple of those won't set you back a lot of money either. But it means you can get that server out of the way. In fact, literally, you'll need that. One plug, network cable in the back, put it anywhere you want. Put it in the shed. Put it in the, the garden under a tarp if you want. If, it, if that doesn't work, um, don't blame me though. But you can just keep it away uh, from, from anywhere that it's going to annoy you. Uh, because it's, it's worth it really for less than $500. Uh, because of course if you built a really splendid box, you spent $2,000 on a, a nook then yes, it's going to be quieter. But are you really want to get, ha, let it gather dust in a cupboard out of the way? You probably want to use it for something a lot more fun than just building servers. So hopefully you found this useful. So check out eBay. There's, it's, it's one of these areas where most of the people buying servers want to play with Hyper-V or, or ESXi. Um, so there's a lot of, there is a lot of guides out there uh, for how to do this on a lot of the common models like DL350s, R710s, or forums like uh, Reddit's Home Labs forum. It, it's it's not something you want to go down a rabbit hole on. Use some of the guides on there to sort of get you over some of the hurdles. Like if you need to reflash a HBA or something like that because you can't find the, the, the drivers. But to be frank, most of the stuff you're going to buy, like a 300 quid um, R710 or... Uh, DL380G7, uh, uh, it's it, it's going to be uh, mostly from one of these vendors uh, that buy older equipment, they refurbish them, uh, they take all of this out and send them out. Uh, they'll be clean because they've been in a server room uh, for the last seven, eight years, um, and they'll work uh, because they've been maintained fundamentally until somebody got rid of them. Uh, and that's, that's, that's all there is to it to be honest buy one if it's useful if it's not useful then don't but hopefully this has been useful 
look at Hyper-V, look at ESXi, let us know how you get on. So tweet us at Practical365. I would love to know if you've went away and built your own lab server. Uh, a couple of folks um, who've been following what I've been doing on Twitter have done the same thing, <laughs> uh, which I didn't expect anybody to do. But it's one of these areas where, for me, it's always been really, really useful. You know, it's, I've, I would definitely say that I've benefited more by being able to learn about stuff in my own environment, in my own time, than I would have been able to just try and do everything in production or share a, a lab environment with, with colleagues. So give it a go. If it works for you, that will be absolutely fantastic. Thanks for watching and catch us on YouTube for more videos. If you've liked this, don't forget to subscribe and like the video. Um, and we'll be back for more videos soon.